uh, we do thank you for uh, this day that you've made. Father, we, we certainly do pray for those in our midst who are uh, under the weather, uh, or whether that's uh, toothaches or sickness, we do pray that you would intervene on their behalf, Father, that, um, that all those would uh, find rest, uh, even as they work through those things, Father, but that you'd bring them back to full strength. We do lift up, in particular, Brother Emmanuel, uh, to you as well, Father, and just pray that this would be a time of, of clarity and focus uh, to hear your heart, uh, not just for himself, but for your people. We thank you, God, as always, for all of our leaders. Thank you for, for Tim and the words that uh, you have prepared for him to share, even on short notice, Father. We pray that those those words would resonate uh, in in the hearts and minds of the listeners, Lord, and that it would produce uh, the good good fruit uh, of uh, in your purposes and your will, uh, Father. It is uh, our heart's desire to be a people who truly are unified one to another, Lord, not just in in mind but in heart, uh, in truth and in practice. And so, Lord, we. We ask that you would help us to even overcome the difficulties of, of being apart. But Lord, we know that even as we are apart, we are unified by your spirit. And so we, we give you this day as we give you all days uh, to move, uh, to, to guide, to lead, to establish, to strengthen, to encourage uh, each of us, Father, in, in your name, in your power, in your wisdom. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> um, I am have some thoughts on my mind and I also want to maybe even give an opportunity for you guys to share a little bit <clears throat> if there are are certain things that the Lord has put on your heart um, not necessarily like you have a teaching prepared or whatever but I think you know there <clears throat> as we continue to as the Lord continues to work out really what the culture of God's house is in our midst and as we as a, a community try, uh, continue to try to put those things into practice through various means um, you know, one thing I, I guess that's on my mind is I was talking with Andy a few days ago, and Andy, I don't know if you're able to materialize into words some of the things that that were on your heart, because I know you were still settling, you know, trying to figure that out. But um, uh, in terms of what it, something Andy said is I felt he, that he felt that there was. Uh, <laughs> at least for his part, um, you know, a bit of a, felt like getting traction a little bit, like making some progress um, in, uh, in what the Lord's actually doing in our midst and what that means, means to him. And those are good things for, for, I think, to some extent for us to hear together and also, you know, for us to weigh out and, and knowing and, and having some additional understanding of how the Lord is speaking and, and moving in our midst. Uh, the Lord's always doing a lot. You know, I'm hearing some really good reports of the Lord speaking and doing a deep work in people's hearts. And also we're two or three weeks in now to some kind of renewed engagements with the young people. And so, you know, maybe maybe there's some observation from your part as parents and just some of the things that that you're seeing with your young ones <clears throat> um, but anyway I'm not looking for anything super specific but you know if there's something that would be a, a, a good report um, to share with with everyone then I want to give an opportunity for you guys to, to share that Just don't go all at once. It doesn't work very well on Zoom. (laughs) 
Somebody, anybody? <laughs> you put them on the spot. Yeah. I'm putting all of you on the One spot. More time. <clears throat> I know for my part, uh, and just, I'm seeing a, a, a very much a fundamental transformation of perspective for my, my children, um, you know, especially the younger three, um, and that has come into some of the, the curiosity that, and, and conversation that they've had with us and others just about I think Noah I, I mean I think uh, Elijah and Naomi recently had some conversation together about just how our community has changed over the years you know obviously when we were Rachel how old was everybody when we moved out of Austin well, I know on, our, on our family uh, you know uh, Haley, when you guys moved out, uh, Haley hadn't even been born yet. Mm. Yeah, Esther was three when we left Texas. So. Wow. And now Esther's going to be 16 in March. So, yeah. 13 years-ish, you know, so. But anyway, they were having a conversation. Uh, the reason I brought up that is because they have... We've, we've been through so many things over over the course of the last 15 years, really. <clears throat> and a lot of the change that took place over that was different locations, different relationships, kind of a... <clears throat> it's interesting to me to see it from th or through the eyes of a young person, you know, because as, a, as adults, we're really going through some more dramatic things where you know we're, we're relocating we're reestablishing we're having to get reemployed and figure out how to provide and protect the family and all those kinds of things and so sometimes well most of the time those those become pretty overwhelming you know and you, you live in a state of survival almost but <laughs> not with the young people you know for them there's changes for sure um and a, a level of um, unsettlement, you know, I remember that being really difficult for my, my kids. Moving out of Texas was really hard. And then moving around in California a couple of times, you know, there were a lot of relationships that had been established that then were just basically laid aside. And, you know, we had to go and re renew that. And then that's even happened on a couple occasions out here. And so... I think part of what's going on in, in, in what I'm seeing in my own children is that there's some establishment in relationships that's beginning to settle in their hearts. And so as a natural extension of that and, and just not just but including the, 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 the deep investment that others are taking in their lives, uh, those involve, I mean, we as parents, yes, other uh, parents and adults in the community for sure um, and then in, in a more concentrated and concerted effort with the education center uh, you know brother Emmanuel and, and Justin and and Noah and Elaine are taking some very you know sp specific roles in engaging and uh, you know they're that wasn't the subject matter I don't think of uh, Elijah and Naomi's conversation so much as uh, just that they began to think about the community as a whole mm. and that there's something recognizable about it and they you know there I think some of their words were you know this has grown and become something and not just from a numbers count you know because we're not really changing in numbers so dramatically you know the, the we we have had in the last year and a half or so three other families you know really join in in the fellowship um and yeah that is growth for sure but more so i think elijah mentioned you know the growth that growth and wisdom and understanding that we are having together as a community of 
even at a fundamental level, what it means to be a community of God's people. And so I'm encouraged by that, not because it's we are or they are a finished work by any means, but that even some of our young folks are starting to to look at the community itself and and even ask, what are we? Who are we? What are we for? Where are we going? What are we going to become? You know, that's pretty amazing. Um, Elijah asked me the other day, um, Dad, do you think that there are others, uh, other communities like ours out there? <laughs> Well, absolutely I do. You know, I don't know how many, I don't know who they are, and I don't know where they are. But, you know, I really do see, um, and I don't think that's really the heart of the question there. What I'm looking at is in the hearts of the young people and thinking that their perspective and their vision of life is beginning to be founded or centered on what it means to be a community. And that's a very encouraging thought because I know for us, uh, even even those of us who have been walking together for 10 plus, 15 years, you know, we didn't know. We, we and, and whatever we thought that that was, was continually undone and redone, you know, because it was still based on so many things that were really most of the time somewhat presumptuous and I don't mean that just to, to, to speak critically or negatively of them but you know only within the last three or four years have we really begun to even <clears throat> I'm thinking of even the, the words that we use in our fellowship and communication only within for, for sure the last five years have we really more deeply considered and, and looked in at what it means to be a uh, what the kingdom culture is, what the culture of God's house is. And, uh, and so it's definitely encouraging to see that begin to take root. And, uh, you know, in many ways, it is and will more quickly thrive in the midst of our young people than, than with some of us as uh, adults. You know, there's a lot of things that we still either hold on to or are not aware of in relation to, you know, religious thinking and acting and doing, you know, um, that have have caused some stumbling and hindrance and resistance for us, knowingly or not. And uh, I, I, I do pray that, that the, the blessing and the favor that God is showing to our young people, you know, that we will be joyful recipients of that as well and and really become a healthy community of God's people so anyway now you made me share I did it's your it's it's your your turn well about uh, about my that that comment that I told you the other day I uh it's really hard to quantify like mm. how that's how it's coming to pass like the that feeling but mm. just like the last two weeks i feel like i mean I, and it, it really it's like it's more of the, the personal opening of understanding like i don't, I don't know It's not like, uh, I don't know, but I guess I was looking back over my notes here and the there's a lot of good things that we're learning about, but my heart is desiring relationship to be the key part of all of this learning, like mm. the having a relationship with people, I don't know, <laughs> I guess it's, it's hard to really put it into words, but mm. I grew up in the church, everybody knows that, I grew up in the church and, you know, have a pretty good foundation on biblical stuff, I think, you know, my father was 
a pretty solid character for giving understanding to us as kids and my mom too. So there's lots of information, you know, that you can gain <laughs> over a lifetime, but it doesn't it doesn't really mean that you're growing something my family's relationship was uh, lacking in, in like we, we had understanding in biblical stuff and we loved each other but community wise though there was lacking there was things lacking in how to do community and how to mm. how to build relationship you know, they did the best they could, my parents, and, and I don't fault them for it at all, you know. I, I had a wonderful childhood, and but I, I'm just seeing, I'm seeing the, the connection. I'm seeing, it's like opening to me the understanding of of what God really is desiring out of his people <laughs> in relationship. Mm. And I'm not saying that I, I'm, I'm there or anything like that. I'm not, I haven't reached some kind of I don't know. I, in my own walk, in my own which is a very Christianese way to <laughs> put things, but in my own walk um, Growing as a as a person was always like oh you got to grow as a Christian and gain understanding and be reading the Bible and making sure that you hit these different points along the way in your Christian walk. But uh, as as Emmanuel and, and you have said, you know, like the the modern Christian church doesn't. It's a very individualistic thing and. It's, it's really centered on just trying to advance yourself and maybe advance a few other people along the way so you can feel better about yourself, you know, like helping a few people out as you go. And, mm. <clears throat> but what we've been learning about sonship <clears throat> and making a decision as, as to the, one of the things that hit me, like, a bunch was like the marriage relationship that was two weeks ago the marriage relationship being a covenant a decision you know that you enter into <laughs> and you know you guys have been working on that with me and I think with Lady too as oh, we come from a place of well let's just kind of let's kind of go this way because we feel like we're being led that way you know yeah instead of taking the opportunity to, to really look into something and, and ask the Lord and be, you know, just have an open heart to put yourself before someone else that, that He has brought into your life that you trust and, yeah, decision-making stuff. But, Hmm. The covenant, the decision thing was a really, a really. <clears throat> well, and that being something that's not just God ordained, you know, as if God ordained for man and woman to be in covenant relationship, but that, you know, this is someone that God has clearly revealed or shown that you should be in covenant with. You know, it's a very. It's not a. It's not a. Um, just a, a loose, general application, mm -hmm. you know, to to a relationship. It's something that's quite specific, and I, I think that's something that we see both with Jesus' relationship with his disciples, and even another example of the relationships that Paul had with those that he, you know discipled and traveled with you know the he was very there were there were different kinds of relationships and something that god will continue to to work out in our midst are 
the various spheres of relationships. Um, Which ones are those that are, you know, divinely appointed covenantal relationships? And even within that context, you know, uh, as we have engaged in and with discipleship, that's another, another level of both covenant and accountability in relation to our spiritual well-being and functionality. And so, but there are many spheres of relationship. Not everyone in that same illustration, not everyone is your wife. Not everyone is your husband, you know, your spouse. It's a different relationship. And so, you know, you can have a, a certain level of communication with another person, but it's not that same and it's not simply a matter of intimacy in life. Uh, it's a, it is a matter of a commitment to that relationship. And marriage is a good example of that, you know, in the, in the, long, in, in the longevity of a marriage relationship, you see that, you know, it's more about that commitment than it is to, than it is to feelings and circumstances, um, and that's that's where those marriage vows come in. <laughs> so clearly, you know, through all things, basically, and unto death, you know, that that kind of of language is is there. Um, but you know, those things have been pretty twisted around in the minds of, of modern society as well. Um, yeah, you know, I think one of the key things. Relationship is something that I pray the Lord will continue to open up for us, practically speaking. There's only so much that you can teach uh, about relationship and about how something works out in and through relationship. But every practical truth that we are given in principle uh, in relation to um in connection with what it means to be a people of God and what it means to grow as a community of God and what it means to put spiritual truth and principle into practice is meant to be fleshed out in relationship. And, you know, that's something that, uh, you know, a few weeks ago and even previously, we I had some a little bit of focus on the topic of, of the, the Word becoming flesh. And, you know, when we look at that, uh, in uh, even in the beginning of God, where God was, in His intention in, in creation, and where He continues. You know, God even told the, the Israelites later on that He would dwell with them and among them. And so, there's some similar language there that is indicative of of the way that God wants to relate to people. In the beginning, it says. That, that there's a description of some of the practical sides of the relationship that he had with Adam and Eve. And that is that he would walk with them in the garden. And so their walk with are two terms that we use in Christianity a lot that, that you know you were just saying, to use some Christianese, my walk with the Lord. What are we talking about? We're talking about our relationship with God. What, our, our walk with someone else. It is our journey through days and life and time in relationship to another person. That's our walk with them. And so, you know, that there was obviously a, a very, there was a disruption of that because this is even the, the difference in the, in the means by which we gain wisdom and knowledge and, and thereby become like or or have imparted to us the likeness of God. The, the big differentiation or the big uh, line of demarcation that, that the Lord, that God drew early on was that in, pre, in presenting or showing that there was another way to attain wisdom and knowledge. That being through the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And so not only did that not fully represent the whole nature and character of God, more importantly, God said, don't partake of that. 
Don't eat it. Don't consume it. Think about the whole process of consumption from sight to harvest to eating, chewing, swallowing, processing, digesting, you know, letting whatever you have digested become a part of you as it is dispersed into, into yourself and becomes a part of your being. And so that is very much a, a spiritual picture and, and representation of a way of gaining knowledge. And God, and I know this is not new information to us at all, but I really want us to process it in the context of relationship. God said that's not the way. And, and then Satan, in that deception there, came to further undermine one of the fundamental pillars of a relationship, which is trust. Did God really say? Which is the same thing that he did with uh, Jesus during the temptation in the wilderness. If you really are the Son of God, did God really say, do you really believe this, or is did, does God have some ulterior motive for you and for himself? Does he really intend to do what you think he intends you to do? You know, And in the end, if he does, then he wouldn't have withheld this from you because this will give it to you. So there's this, this manipulation and wrap around pursuing wisdom, knowledge, without the context of the father-son relationship. When we look at the, the, the genealogy that's, I think, in, in Matthew, is it Matthew or Luke? Anyway, it, it takes the, 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 the genealogy from Jesus Christ all the way back to Adam. And it calls him, yes, through David, but he calls him the, the, son, of, the son of God. Adam, the son of God. <laughs> and so, you know, in creation... Adam was known to be, this is my son, you know, and we've, we've talked before about how God timed the fulfillment of, or, or that the, when he first created everything, the timing was very important to him in that he, he reserved man's, the creation of man to be the last thing he created so that all other creation could, could watch it happen. So, but in, in that, was, was, the, was God only having creation see that he could do this miraculous thing? The angels and every, every other created thing that was making observation of that go, oh, wow, look, you know, God's really powerful and creative. And, you know, he can turn dirt into life. All right, you know, thanks, God. You know, back to our deal. Or, you know, evidently not. You know, the serpent was, for some reason, very interested in the relationship between man and God. So his, his usurping it was not just the happenstance. You know, he was looking to bring a division between a very specific kind of relationship and fellowship between the father and son. And the, one of the first things that he sowed was a, a, was a, was a word, a seed, a cord of disunity, dis, uh, of, of malcontent, and, and a lack of trust. Is that really the case? And so, you know, what was really broken and needed restoration was that re relationship between the father and son. Now, what had God... What was God already doing? What had God intended to do as he walked with Adam in the garden? You know, we, we need to really spend some time thinking about God's intention and purpose in it. You know, I mean, it's not like God in heaven is like, well, you know, it's that time of day. I'm going to go have my walk. You know, go spend a little time with Adam because whatever. No, I mean, that was like... There was a lot involved there in terms, it, it, no, those things are not fully expounded in the scriptures, but we see them more fully expounded in the life of Christ, in Jesus, the last Adam, Jesus, the Son of God. And so, you know, man, 
to this day is still pursuing wisdom and knowledge, whether that be through religious piety or through philosophical, you know, understanding or, you know, whatever else, man is still seeking out his place and peace with, with others and, you know, some sort of peace or, you know, understanding of his creator, but mostly in ignorance and through the, the wrong means. And, you know, religion as a whole, Christianity as a whole, is still trying to pursue relationship to or with God based on, uh, you know, their pursuit of knowledge of God. And they're missing out on the person and the fellowship. What does it mean to be a son of God? You know, the, the current Christian teaching is really distant from what it means to be a son. Current teaching and, and, and focus is typically looking at Jesus as the son and as something that we can never be, but, you know, thankful that he did what he did because, you know, someday, somehow, we're going to be fully restored to whatever, whatever God really has in mind. So we'll just wait around until then. And help other people come to that same position of waiting and, you know, at best, um, you know, engage in some sort of social service so that we can bend someone's ear and put them in the, in the waiting room too. You know, the waiting room of God's going to make everything right someday. And in reality, what God had begun in creation was not a finished work. It would not be finished until he had discipled his son. And then his son was able to reproduce after that kind of mature son. And then God would have a people for himself in whom, with whom, and among whom he could dwell. And he would be fully known. How? Through the context of corporate relationship. Not just singular God to, to a man relationship. And that's what was going to set people, mankind, initially as God created, apart from every other created being was because of their corporate relationship, this manifestation of life and relationship to one another as a rep representation of God. God made flesh. So I like that. I think it's amazing that God is not content with only being fully manifest in Jesus Christ to the Son. That's not enough for him. <laughs> not like God's greedy or insatiable, but that his plan was bigger than that. His plan was bigger than this was my son, he did everything that I wanted, and you know, look at him. He wanted that to be replicated. He wanted it to be family. And, and for the culture, the way of life, to be expressed through a people. So, and we've touched on this a few times, but it's fascinating to see the way that Christianity was described throughout the early church age. Um, I was listening to someone else and I heard something that I've, I don't know who initially said it, but... Um, it was a, a link that Emmanuel sent out, you know, maybe a couple weeks ago or something, and it was a guy, some scholarly man talking about Christianity and his understanding. He was being interviewed. I don't know if any of you guys saw that video or not, but he was being interviewed by another, uh, it sounded like somebody from England or something like that. But anyway, he was saying, you know, Christianity or Christian was not ever really even a, a, a positive term. It was a, it was a negative con connotation. You know, you're you're this you're one of those mini Christs. You know, like you're just trying to be like someone else. Where even among Christians, they they didn't refer to themselves as Christians, and that's true even if you if you if you read the the uh, uh, the story through Acts, the the history there. And even through Paul's epistles, it shows up here and there. And a lot of it is lost in the English translation. Um, but the way the people were described were basically those who practiced the way. Followers of the way. That's what it was called. It was called the way. Now, 
uh, that's fascinating because, uh, you know, it, in all of our conversation, discussion, teaching, and otherwise, and even in my personal time before the Lord and conversation with Emmanuel and others about the culture of God's house, what we're really talking about is a different way of life. It's the way. The way. What is the way? And so that applies to every single situation, relationship, communication that we have, decision that we make in life, and in other words, how does this, how does this, come in line with the way and that's not something that we we force ourselves to do but it's something that the indication through the scriptures that we have is that it is the spirit of god that will lead us in that way in that kind of relationship in that kind of community in that kind of fellowship but it will it will be and and that's why you know when i'm looking at my young people or all of our young people I want to have some insight into their life to how, how are they thinking. And it's not that they need to be formally using the same words and phrases that we, that we do. But how is this permeating the way that they look at the world, the way they see themselves as involved in that and in, our commun- in, in the community of God's people and, uh, and, and in the context of their lives and the relationships that they have with others? It's a different way. And that is, it is this way that would, that would set God's people apart from every other people on every other nation, every other culture, you know, every other belief, and every other created thing was that this way of life, this way of relationship and engagement would, would be from heaven. And Jesus came to be, even, even the Apostle John ha- had said, what was his cry in the wilderness? I'm a voice crying in the wilderness, crying out what? Prepare, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. You know, the coming of the King. And so, and, and these are all things that we touched on in, in, in you know, previous times. But when there's a change of leadership that, in, in, in governance, <clears throat> then there's going to be new way of thinking, a new way of doing things. And, you know, John came as one who was a, a herald uh, and, and not even one who yet was able to really walk in that way. He knew it was coming. And that's why Jesus said, well, even the, even the least in my kingdom, even the, the least of those who practice this way of life will be greater why? Because it will become a living reality in them. And uh, we, uh, I mean, even us as a small community of people, I think we're, we're just now starting to step onto that first step of what it means to, how do we really actively in a living, practical, everyday part of life live in this way? And some of the things that we still struggle with are, you know, basically thinking that that means we gather and fellowship in a certain way, but not necessarily that we have more uh, practical relationship and communication in that way. Religion, all, Christianity in particular, always wants to take a principle and put it into some sort of activity or program. It's religious activity. And so then we can come away and say, well, that was the way, <laughs> but not necessarily recognize it or even invite it into every aspect of our life, you know, in our thinking and in our, in our weighing out and engagement with relationships. I think we're making, I, I definitely think that we're, our, our focus is, is beginning to bend over to that direction but we're only really beginning to even practically do that. You know, there, there are still many things that we do together, whether that's, you know, one-on-one through discipleship relationship or in various gatherings that we have that are still, you know, in our minds and hearts defining that from a religious context and not from uh, something that is 
I don't even know how to describe it because it hasn't really been opened up to us yet. I, and I'm not being critical. I'm just making you know a very frank observation. And again, it's not critical. It's not looking at myself or you guys or anyone and saying we're not where we should be. It's that we're just coming into like this new horizon of engagement. And um, even when I think about the last three years with all the shutdowns and separations and stuff that took place with COVID and, you know, some of the, some of the things that came out prophetically through that in that the Lord were, the Lord was really giving opportunity for his people as a whole to really reevaluate their way of life. So, you know, we're, there's one segment of people that are looking at, oh, this is the devil and it's evil and this is planned by evil people and whatever else. And, you know, the enemy's just trying to stop the gathering of God's people and whatever else. But there was another thought or consideration that was like, oh, maybe God has given us a bit of a wake up call as, a, as his people and saying, how about you reevaluate your way of life? your way of fellowship, your way of engagement, and your way of relationship, you know? Not that he just wants us to meet on Zoom now so we don't die of some disease, but... <laughs> yeah, and continue to meet with the same veiled heart yeah. and mind. Just on a computer instead. <laughs> you know, it, it, it was... Uh, and I think that that is still a lingering effect, you know? I think, honestly, I think that there are still some questions in the hearts and minds of our people. Why don't we do things in a certain way? Why don't we meet like this? Why don't we fellowship like this, you know, more often or not or whatever? And it's still clinging on to what is most easily described as an old wineskin. But that's to oversimplify it. It is that, but that's an oversimplification of something that is really deeply rooted in our hearts that has an adverse it's, it's adverse, it's against the, the, the work and the power of the life that God wants to have released in our midst. And, and it's one of the reasons that it's really difficult for me in particular, maybe for Emmanuel as well, maybe when Emmanuel communicates it in certain ways, it's kind of like, oh, I don't even understand fully what he's talking about. And for me, it may be more that I don't even know how to describe it. But it's because these things are not really, it's really difficult if, if we were to, and, if we, and when we do verbalize them in a particular way, especially sitting as, you know, uh, as leadership in a community or someone who has a role to teach or whatever else, then how it comes across and received can, it feels so rigid. It feels so... Uh, uh, legalistic and whatever else, you know, like, well, that's just a boundary. That's just a demand. That's just a, uh, a, 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 a you know, uh, a, it seems forced or whatever else. That's the way the human mind and heart receive those things. And, and again, that's not an accusation to any person because I feel many times the awkwardness of trying to communicate it and thinking, well, that sounds like this, you know, it doesn't sound right. And so in reality, those things will, they're not going to automatically flesh out, okay? If you were to, let's go back to Andy, the, the illustration that you gave. You know, if there were certain things that, that any husband and wife here laid out prior to their marriage and said, you know, if we listed all of our preferences and demands and, you know, when we get in an argument, then we need to do this and not that or whatever. Like if we laid those things out, that, that same, you, you might start to question whether or not you want to commit to that relationship. You know, it's be like, there's too many, there's too many factors here. Like, I don't know if I can do all that. <laughs> I don't know if I can meet all those demands. And like, why, I didn't even know that that's what we were doing was like committing to all this little stuff. We don't think that way. We, we think primarily about our commitment, our commitment of love to that person. And then we, we know that as we go through life, and there are probably things that we have gone through in every relationship that is represented here that could have been, if, and it's not about knowing the future or anything like that, but we would have never known what we would have to go through. We would have never known what we would endure 
not even necessarily because of something that one person did or the other or whatever else, but I mean just the things that we would go through in life together. Maybe that didn't have anything to do with either one of us. That, that may have caused us a pause. And again, I'm not talking about knowing the future. But like when, when, when you're committing to that, then what you're committing to in that covenantal relationship is whatever comes, whatever it is, then this commitment will endure. And in a similar way, because our relationship with the Father, who is perfect, who is sovereign, and who is omnipotent, who is deserving of all of our trust and hope, then we can go through that relationship with the settlement of knowing, well, no matter what is ahead, God will provide, God will protect, God will enable, you know, and, and so we don't have to resist that. And that can be, and is meant to be, too, the corporate sense that God's people have, not only together with one another, but with God himself. And uh, anyway, those are um, just some of the thoughts that I've had in relation to, you know, it, what you had mentioned, Andy, about I think relationship is is key and something that we should really continue to you know meditate on in prayer before the Lord. Um, yes, there are divinely appointed, uh, as we have mentioned, you know, the discipleship relationship is is really by a, a divine appointment, and and it, and that's one of those spheres of relationship that's on a higher level of priority in our life for the sake of spiritual growth and well-being. But there are other, you know, relationships between brothers and sisters and the community together that have another level of, of commitment and, and engagement along those lines. And I'm at one of those points where I don't have a lot of words to describe what's, what's in my mind. But and, and heart, but I think that that's something that would be uh, well. We would do well to really seek the Lord, um, so that our hearts are prepared, not for the teaching so much as it comes in the days ahead, but for the practice of it in in our midst. And that is the, that's the thing that God says will set his people apart and that the whole world will see and will become a witness, not only to the nations, but in the heavenly realms as well. Anyone else have some thoughts or something to share? I... Thank Tim that I, you know, I for sure want to be on topic <laughs> here. Um, I know all of us have so much in our hearts. Um, I for sure am am resonating with what you're saying and um, feeling that I'm I'm excited about it. And uh, you know, I was I was up late actually, just kind of overflowing to Benjamin last night. Um, for sure, uh, having so much desire to uh, pour into our kiddos, and um, you know, I, I definitely feel and know that each one of us carry something so important um, to to bring to the community as adults, but for sure the children as well. And um, right now, I'm just kind of as a season. Uh, over the last few weeks, just really kind of brimming over with, um, you know, desire to offer, you know, what the Lord has put into my heart related to teaching and homeschooling and uh, discipling our children and creating um, family culture, uh, you know, in, in line with his heart and being um being able to to be led by that as far as making decisions those practical decisions that you're talking about 
as parents and, and homeschooling parents, uh, ha kind of having that compass um, to guide our decision making and having the confidence and peace and empowerment knowing who we are and who we're made to be and then uh, being able to turn around and, you know, hand that to our children. And, uh, you know, Ben's constant encouragement to me is give it a little time. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, for sure, I'm doing that and giving it a little time. And I'm grateful for his, you know, wisdom and, and always being willing to, to bring me back to that place and allow the Lord to season and mature, um, you know, what, what he's doing. Um, but I just want to add it, it hopefully, um, on to what you're saying as far as feeling so strongly that in these different spheres of life that the Lord is bringing about um, this depth and newness and um, hopefully that's on topic. <laughs> yeah. I think so much of what the Lord is doing right now is in the in the realm of the Spirit. Um, and yes, there are some practical things that we're beginning to, to flesh out. Um, but I think there's so much more that he wants really settled in our hearts um, before that, you know, before an outward, a full outward expression. And I, I don't say that to, to limit anything, you know, but that that we we as you're mentioned, as, as you're saying that we let God really work that out in us and then. You know, when God makes the timing obvious, it, it may be for many for many of us that when the timing is obvious, God has done such a substantial work in our inner man that what we had what we had thought at the beginning that we would you know in a sense go out and do may have dramatically changed because of the interchange within us. And uh, Amen. you know, I, I think that that is why. In many ways, we've we've had <clears throat> what feels like a a, a a a slow process of putting things into practice, and uh, you know part of that's because of the rebellion and resistance in our own heart that many times that we're not even aware of, and some of it is just a working out of God's timing, you know, as well. I think it's both really; they work together. Sister, why don't you why don't you pray pray for us in that light? Lord, we just do come to you um, grateful for how you do things, Lord. Grateful for how you love us, and um, grateful for what you're up to, Lord. I just trust your process. I trust your heart, and I am. Um, I am just in awe of of what you're doing. Um, I just bless all these people here, Lord, and their families. And um, I thank you for this um, just positive moment, Lord, to acknowledge what you're doing and what you've done. And um, we're saying again that we are willing to wait on your timing word and we're saying again that we want to be transformed from the inside out Lord, to match your frequency to match your uh, your way um so just continue to do your good work lord in us and um continue to bring that that joy in the waiting room. I, I know Tim was mentioning the waiting room negatively before, uh, but right now, Lord, I'm thinking about um, the the waiting room as as an active place within your process. And I'm reminded of a dream that um, you gave to Rachel years ago, and she was dancing with her dad, um, and it was in the waiting room. And this this waiting on you is not um, just a passive um, thing that we have to just wait for it to end, Lord, but it's an active uh, alignment with you and, and following your lead and um, 
it's a, it's a progressive relationship with you, Lord, in every moment as you teach us your fatherhood and you teach us um, unity and all along the way as we conform and transform uh, to be who it is um, that we're destined to be. Lord, so I just, uh, I, I thank you for this moment in the waiting room in that sweet, um, intimate, active, connected way, Lord, as we are willing um, and, and not waiting for some perfect amazing explosion, Lord, but just grateful for the waiting with you as we allow you to work out what you're doing um, within us and, and among us and through us. And we just yield again to that process. And um, I, I just want to turn over again, Lord, any um, old way, old uh, mm, preconception, misconception, misunderstanding, or false mindset, or false um, anything old, Lord, that would put a frame around um, something alive and beautiful that you want to bring forth. And um, I just pray that you would continue to shed those things, that you would continue to bring them to light, shedding those things and uh, being rid of them so that we can be made new in you. Lord, and I just pray that as this perspective um, grows and it, and it goes from something dead and old to something not only alive but vibrant and just pulsing with you, Lord, I just pray that we would um, all fall into step and just rejoice in you in, in this whole process, Lord, as you bring about your people and your community and, and the relationships in every direction. Lord, that they all be touched and blessed by this renewed perspective in you, Lord. Amen. Mm. Amen. <clears throat> Justin or Nicole, anything on you guys in? Yeah, I think... <laughs> One of the things kind of falling in line with what we're talking about today and continuing to focus on divine relationships that the Lord has really been parsing out in our lives with the kids, with ourselves, is really considering uh, the spirit of offense and how it so easily can move in our lives and how so so easily we can take up or, or like you had shared a few weeks ago, like make agreements with that. And so we've been having a lot of conversations just within our own family about just interactions and how in the in the community of, of people, and that could be just, you know, brother to sister, parent to kid, or just in our relationships, how the enemy is, has really cleverly uh, snuck into our, I think, the way that we live our lives in kind of that old pattern of, of uh, just always feeling like you need to either compare or judge or, you know, it's like we want in our own lives, whenever we make mistakes, we want mercy. But when other people do something or offend us or hurt us or whatever, we want judgment for them. And so we've been having a lot of conversation just about how, first of all, we, we, we need to worry less about kind of imposing on other people our thoughts of what they should do or and really judging them, but really trying to to seek how we come to the Lord in right relationship with him and really first separating out and, and working against that spirit of offense and making sure that that is not the, the spirit that we are operating in, responding to, um, but that we're being much more uh, ready and able to, to, to lay down those thoughts um, because I, I think we're, we're seeing in particular like there's it, again and again and again how, how easily we pick up that mantle and the more that we are disciplining ourselves to, to, to focus on the first the right relationship with God and making sure that he is uh, that his spirit is the one that we're leading then frees us to when it comes to behavior or issues to worry less about the offense or the thing that happened and to prioritize the relationship 
and and so what that has looked like in tangible ways is just really trying to 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 seek in relationship with one another as setting that a, a first priority that relationship that god has given us mm. and that even in the offense what we're going about doing if if we feel like things need to be resolved and and i think we're becoming more and more aware of like not every issue that happens in life is one that requires <laughs> going to a person saying something or managing it or dealing with it or figuring it out you know there's plenty of things in life where you just take it to the lord and that's sufficient because your heart needs to be in a, a place but at those times where the lord is leading that really the the response of the heart is going for restoration of relationship and and the priority of relationship is not in telling the person what they're doing wrong it really is in, in loving and walking with one another and so I, I don't know if I, I'm making clear sense because it's very clear in my mind in art so I don't know if I'm articulating it correctly but I think the spirit of offense and the spirit of judgment and really parsing that out and really being very diligent to number one identify that that is what's happening and number two to to bring those things to the Lord before we act in, in any way, before we respond, before we pursue, is to really practically come back to the, the primary relationship being that of what the, what the Lord is doing, what his, how his spirit is leading. And so as that's happening, it feels like there's been plenty more opportunities that the Lord has brought to address those things. And so that's kind of the process that we're in. And so a lot of our conversation is, is, is kind of coming out of the realm of the natural world, which is focusing on behavior and moving more into the spiritual realm of addressing the spirits that are behind things and beginning to, to develop an understanding of, of what does that look like? What does that feel like? And, and then how does, how does the spirit of God want to to deal very particularly with those issues. Uh, because again, I think I find so much of what we experience in life, what, and, and I know for Nicole and I, we've really identified this, the, the way that we were parented in particular by our parents was to very much focus on the behavior. And there, there was, it was like when you acted wrongly, it was, there was an offense there. And so the corrective measure wasn't the restoration of relationship it was the do better in your behavior do better in in not offending me or not harming me or whatever so yeah i think that's a place of settlement where we're where the lord is really working in our lives and hearts mm -hmm. is to as it pertains to relationships and all relationships that god has given us to make sure that we're that we're very quick to identify the heart of God in the matter and, and to cut away any spirit of offense at all, to not even entertain that as a uh, as an okay pattern, uh, because that's certainly, I think, what we've been taught. Mm. Yeah, cultivating relationships is a, there's a difference between, you know, uh, doing something with someone, you know, whether that's uh, a time of um, entertainment, relaxation, or even intentional time. And, you know, this, for instance, you know, a, a student can sit in the class with his instructor and learn a lot of things. Uh, a, a, an athlete can, you know, in a sport like say like tennis or something can really receive a lot of discipline and instruction from their trainer but the nature of the relationship it may just be discipline and training and not in the cultivation of a relationship you know and that may be rarely the case in, in those kind of scenarios because it's, it's almost inevitable that they do. But, like, I think some of the greatest influential relationships have come not because of the discipline itself, 
but because of the cultivation of a relationship that goes beyond the discipline of life. And I think that that's the, much of what, you know, a father and son relationship is not solely related on the discipline of life. You know, not just punitive discipline for doing wrong things, but discipline to guide in the right way. You know, it's not, that's not the whole gist of that relationship. The majority is the, the cultivation of the, the, the intimate, uh, intimate connection between the father and son and the desires of their hearts aligning with one another. You know, I, I definitely have really personally experienced that in my own life with my, with my dad. And, you know, that, I think that's one thing that's, you know, throughout the course of my life, especially, you know, the, the, the first part of my life was that I was really taking on, I mean, this is my earthly father's perspective in life, his demeanor. And, uh, and looking forward to the things that he looked forward to. And, you know, I can very tangibly recollect what it, what it was like to have that kind of, of joy and sorrow and pleasure and pain in relationship to him because and at the same time my father was a very very good disciplinarian very measured in his punitive disciplines and also very intentional in his life disciplines and um you know, he also embodied those things. And so, for me, it's quite easy to have at least a, a base level uh, experience with what it is to, to, to have some unity of heart and mind with, you know, in the context of a father-son relationship. How much more so you know, when, if, we, if we reobserve and reconsider the life of Jesus and the focus that he took with his father to learn, to know his, the business, what's his father about? What brings God, my father, pleasure? What grieves him? What does he long for? What does he work for? What does he want to accomplish? Well, I want to accomplish that. And not just as a factual thing, like here's what, here's what my father, here's the bullet points of what he said he wanted to do. But those things actually become the pursuits and desires of our own heart. <clears throat> and that, as expressed not just between a father and a son, which would be the case with God the Father and Jesus, but with a father and his sons, well, then it's a, a corporate expression, a family expression, a family business. This is how this household works. This is what it's going for. This is what it's going to become. This is what it's going to reproduce. This is what grieves the people of God. This is what brings joy to the people of God. This is what the household of God wants to accomplish. And it all proceeds from the heart and the will of the Father. That's what, he's, that's what God is going for in his people. Yes, even in our midst. We need to, that's where we really need to recontextualize our relationship to the Father and your relationship to God is not yours personally. I mean, there is that aspect of it. But in its full reality, it's more than that. It's me, it's it's our relationship with the Father. And not 
Andy and Tim's agreement on what God's <laughs> desire is, but as a source of what comes from God's heart, that we are both so joined together with the heart of God and the joy of it that we too have the same camaraderie fellowship. Now that's the same fellowship that John is referring to in 1 John. That our fellowship is with the Father and the Son. And that's the same alignment with the prayer of Jesus, which is our my prayer, Father, is that they we be one as you and I are one. I and you, you and me. I want them to be like that. They and you, you and them. Because then we will all be as one together. And those are, you know, they seem like far off, distant sometimes statements because they're pretty grand or, you know, uh, I don't know what word used to use to describe them. But we kind of brush them aside. We don't really think that as something that can really be possible to, to, to flesh out. And again, I want to draw that back around and, and maybe I'll continue in, in some of the where we have kind of trailed into in and out of the foundational teachings, you know, for the past few months. But in that uh, um, this is the real un, like the real meaning of what it means for the living word of God, the will of God, the logos, the expressed will of God. To become flesh. It's it's not this momentary instance of, you know, like like I've mentioned before, uh, the immaculate conception in Mary. That was not the word made flesh. It was a miraculous birth, for sure. But the word became flesh when the life of God was being manifest through the way of life and relationship that Jesus exemplified in himself. And that's what he called others to. And uh, Hebrews says it was, it, it was through the veil of his flesh that this new and living way was made available to us. And uh, most of the time we think that only in the context of that because Jesus' flesh was torn, broken on the cross, that therefore our sins are forgiven and then you know we have a way back to the Father. And that is true um, because he was the, 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 the one and only true uh, sacrifice for uh, the prop propitiation of sin, the remission of sin. But that's not all that is there uh, in that Paul says in, in other places in his epistles that even to this day when the law of Moses is read, there is a veil that remains over the hearts of God's people. And so the veil referred to in Hebrews 10 when it's talking about the new and living way um, is the, the veil that uh, the veil of his flesh you know correlated to the veil in the temple that separated the holy place from the rest of the temple and it was torn so therefore this way is opened up <clears throat> but if the physical temple and the veil that was physically torn was a shadow of a spiritual reality, then how then, and, and, and even if Jesus' own body, in his broken body on the cross, and in his death, was also, it was real and symbolic. You know, Paul's epistles were written after the resurrection and ascension and of Christ and his seating at the right hand of God. Then, what veil then still remains? Well, it's not the veil in the temple, you know, the, the shadow. And if Jesus Christ's body was broken and he was buried and, and resurrected and ascended and seated at the right hand of God, then what veil 
remains still? Well, he, he says it's the veil over the heart. The veil over the heart. And so going back to the, the new and living way that Jesus made, through his flesh. So John said earlier that the word became flesh. So Jesus then, there's, there's two... Coming in the flesh is in the midst of mankind, in, embodied in a person, not just the sarx, the Greek word for flesh, the, the, the fleshly body, but a, a personation, a person that is, you know, something beyond just the flesh, right? We all know ourselves to be that as well. And so there's two ways that the life in the flesh can go. One, governed by the sarks, which includes the mind, the will, and the emotions, the flesh. You know, many philosophers have looked into this division of man and, you know, the, what, are the, what are the Freudian differences, the, the, the ego and ego, super ego. ego and superego and whatever else. These are not things that are uncommon to the knowledge of man in the way that, that, that there are different aspects of what makes up the human being as a person, as a body, as a, you know, whatever else. And so, and, and the other thing that we, we, we have looked at as well is what did, what did Jesus mean when he was talking about the fulfillment of the law? Well, ultimately it means it wasn't that Jesus checked off a bunch of lists on... Um, you know, on a piece of paper and said, well, I did these things and I didn't do those things. He became the embodiment. The, he, he was the, the fruit of what the law was meant to produce in a life, a way of life. So even when the religious rulers came to him with that list, you know, Master, what, was, what must I do to inherit the kingdom? And the Lord, you know, Jesus said, well, you know, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And love your neighbor as yourself and, you know, whatever. And he said, one, one, one of the religious leaders or the young man said, well, I've, I've done all these things. I, I've done that. You know, I, I've got the checklist. And then Jesus says, well, then go and do this. And then all of a sudden they realize that their their checklist is valueless because it hasn't be it has they have not embodied it it hasn't become a living way for them and they that was there was conviction of the heart there that took place and they knew they didn't represent it you know and uh, I think Justin just to refer to some of the things that you were talking about about the spirit of fence and other things you know the scriptures that that tell us that love covers a multitude of sins and the other scriptures like in Matthew 18 where there's a recommendation for how to 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 deal with or work with you know a brother that has sinned against you or whatever it is you know that the real motive the real um, uh, motive there is to to bring back into proper relationship to restore relationship and that then the further indication uh, that Jesus gives us is that it is by our love for one another that the world will know who we are and so um, those things all work out very practically in the context of how we do relationships so you know again to be a bit facetious it is not that you know we're going to we're going to get together, you know, this afternoon and all meet at Walmart and walk around as a group in Walmart telling each other how much we love each other and that the other shoppers in Walmart are going to go like, oh, man, those are some, they really have something. What are we going to do, you know? I want to be a part of the group that walks around and tells each other that they love each other. You know, is that really how we think God's love is going to be oppressed? Yes, that's very facetious, but... There's a lot of Christianity doing very similar things. You know, we're going to go show our love by doing certain things, but that doesn't really become anything more than what the, the, the rich young ruler or some of these other, you know, uh, zealous 
religious people were thinking at the same time, oh, I've done all those things. And it's those same dead works is what the apostles call them, of which Jesus will look when they come to him in the day of judgment and Jesus will say, depart from me. There was a work of iniquity. It never, there was no reality in life there. And, uh, you know, that's one of the reasons that we wanted to take time with the, 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 um, with the foundational teachings is because uh, we really want to see God's heart and intention in those in the fundamentals of relationship and specifically discipleship and really begin to expand in our own hearts and minds, not just through te teaching, obviously, but through practical uh, engagement or practice in life. And, and also have a, a very strong assurance, wow, you know, this is the thing that God has been after the whole time. And that, I, we hope, will, it will foster and nurture in us that same longing and desire that the Father has so that as we go about doing it, we will do so not because we feel like we're commanded to do so as Christians or obligated to do so, but because it is the most joyful expression of our life to do it in that way. When we can see that this was the heart of the Father the whole time. The whole time. I was struck... Um Yesterday, the, if it's okay with you, too. Yeah, please. I think it piggybacks on what you were saying. Yesterday, the, you know, the younger kids came over to our place to do the first day of some schooling over there. And uh, I was mostly just, I don't know if Cheryl shared some of these sentiments with the ladies yet or not. We talked about it yesterday. But I was really struck by the... Um, this idea of like they're they were they were learning you know they learned some grammar and they learned some intro Spanish and they learned some science and they did some PE and and they're all kids who have not engaged in the public school system mm -hmm. have but all kids who know each other and are and are with their own family and with other families that have that are part of their family. And I was really struck by the idea that the opportunity there for the kids is not so much of what they're doing, but how they're doing it. Mm -hmm. Like you're talking about the way, the way in which, and it's not in, the learning the science and the grammar and the Spanish is not necessarily as important as how they engage with one another, with their teachers who are the moms, and how they contextualize that in that environment. And you know, if if we have a natural tendency of of how we behave and act in our own family with our own brothers and sisters, with our own parents. We have an understanding of how we interact with um, our friends when we're out on a play date, hanging out, and that's just a normal, natural, familiar way of doing things. But the school gives an opportunity to recontextualize and say, what are we here for? What are we trying to do? Yes, we're trying to learn these things, but so how do we do that? And it gives an opportunity and a, and a, and a context in which to practice how, how do, I, do I act the same way with my brothers and sisters hanging out at home familiarly as I do in a classroom setting? No, probably not. It's a different setting. It's a different purpose involved. And so in the same way, like you're saying, it's not about a checklist of what, what we're doing and, and all the pieces checked off, but how we're engaging with those pieces in the greater context. And so, you know, the foundational teachings, I think, you know, the foundation being set it's not about checking off the foundations as though we just did them, but the foundational teachings give us a context in which to engage in the word we keep using is relationship. Mm -hmm. But how do we how do we engage together in a way that's in the right context? And is it just the familiar context where we all just do naturally? No, obviously not. It's obviously a different way. It's a it's a different way, and it and it changes right within even within each family. The way you act when you're you know. Um, eating together at the dinner table is different than if you're outside playing soccer. It's like a totally different engagement. And so learning how to interact in those ways is, is more important than the what. But 
conversely, if you if you can learn the how, then the what what you're learning is going to be so much better, so much richer, so much fuller, so much you're going to if 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 you if you in the in a classroom setting if you're you know I use a classroom setting which unfortunately has been tainted by public system and everything else but if you're not engaged if you're if you're talking and have your own mindset you're not going to learn anything and you're also not respecting those teaching you and you're not engaging in relationship in the proper way because you're being too familiar and you're acting like it's playtime when it's not it's learning time mm -hmm. so if you give but if you are engaging in the right way, the how is correct, then the what is going to be even more fulfilling, even more beneficial to you. That really struck me yesterday, and I think it relates also to, like you were saying, this, this ongoing process of walking it out is, is less about the checklist and what, what, what it is, and more of how we respond. And even the same way that Justin's talking about if taking offense and receiving things in the soulish way, less about the thing that's happening and more about how we engage with it and how we walk through it. I had a, when I was in um, college, I was part of a kendo club, which is, do is the way of, and ken is the sword, so the way of the sword. And my teacher, he was from Korea, and he was a, he was a believer. And he talked about how kendo is very much like being a believer in that it is a lifelong process. You don't ever arrive. You're never like, you're never like, okay, I've done it. Good, you know, because it's not a checklist that you just check off and then suddenly you're there. It's always, it doesn't mean you don't reach maturity though. It doesn't mean you can't become a, you know, a master or a teacher yourself, but it's a lifelong, it's, there's always room to improve and grow. And so I think we get caught up with wanting to just say, okay, well, how, when do I get there? When am I done? And it's never about being done, like the rich young ruler. He's just like, okay, am I, did I think, did I do it? Am I done? And, and Jesus is like, no, it's ongoing. Like you have to keep. You've done this, great. Let's. What's the next step? What else can you do? It's not. And it wasn't about the what even in that situation. It was about the how that man had engaged with the requirements of the Lord for lack of better understanding. But anyway, I, in that degree, calling back to just you're asking people to share. I do. I am encouraged to see that that uh, it, parallel with the foundational teachings that are starting to emerge is certain contextual opportunities to engage throughout our everyday lives with the schooling and other things. Um, but the end is not the the school is is not the end in and of itself. It's a vehicle for the building of of ways of interacting and, and how we do things together. And so that's really encouraging because like Cheryl was, was mentioning, it's it's like it's exciting and, it, and and in certain ways we're like, okay, we want to like just burst through and keep and like push everything through. But at the same time, there's a there's a just as we grow from a child to an adult, there's a process that happens over over time. It takes time and engagement and practice. And so we're putting into place a certain we're starting, like you said, Tim. At the very, we're at the we're at the beginning stage, where we're starting to put into place things that will give us the opportunity to walk those things out. But it's going to take a step process, and there will be people at various maturity levels along the way that will either be mostly receiving or mostly giving, or somewhere in between, depending on the relationship. Because obviously, my, I have kids in my household that are younger that are mostly receiving, and then have kids who are a little bit older who are mostly receiving in a certain context, but in another context with their younger siblings or friends, they can be giving as well. So anyway, that's that's an encouragement, but I think that it's easy for us to get dis discouraged when we get bogged down in the minutia of the of the what, when that's not the, even the point. That's not even the, mm -hmm. that's even the real point. So anyway, that's, that's it. And I think too, you know, we, we get a little, we always are, many times, we're in the mindset of, are we there yet? Yeah. And um, it, the, the joy is in the journey. Right. Not in the destination. The destination will come, but how you navigate the journey is going to be really the, the meat of 
your your life. And you know, there's a lot of illustrations about taking a journey and you know bemoaning the process the whole time. This is so long. The roads are bad, the, the company's this, and I'm uncomfortable, and it's whatever else. And you, you really miss out on, you know, the joy of traveling together. I remember specifically when I was a kid, like eight or maybe younger, we went to visit, we lived in California, we went to visit Yosemite National Park. And one of the key memories in my mind that I, that I remember more than the, the park was in the rental van, like drawing, like coloring in this, you know, with markers in this in this book in the rental van as we travel. Yeah. More even so than the desktop, like you're saying, <laughs> the, the journey. I remember that that sticks out more to me than the than the than Yosemite itself. It's funny. Yeah. Well, and I I like you know the idea of if if we are if you take the the illustration of. You know, just driving in particular, and if if the Lord is the one who is, you know, at the wheel and doing the navigating, choosing the course, then I don't think either are we just meant to be the the blind participant in the back seat, asleep and you know, <laughs> completely unaware. You know, the, the, God's not necessarily a- asking us which turns to take, but you know. The conversation, the things that are seen along the way, and the experiences that happen along the way, are—it's uh, not a really great illustration because it's not very interactive. It doesn't it? You know, it doesn't really involve much with with life. But I think when we look when we look backwards in life, we can see that journey and the, the presence of the Lord, the goodness of God in things, and maybe even some you know regretful things. You know, if if I had thought or done differently at this time, then, you know, I, I don't know that, well, just there were there would be certain things in relationship to the Lord and others that would be quite different at this point, you know. Maybe those are some, uh, you know, some of those times that we redirect certain things and, you know, make a little bit of a, a circle around the mountain kind of scenario. Um. An illustration keeps coming to mind in the, this greater context is that of uh, the, the, the dining room table or dinner table. You know, if you are, if you have been invited to sit down and you're there, you, there's certain etiquette that you need to follow. Um, and maybe you're not, you're not choosing the dinner. You're not, you're not in the driver's seat. You're not choosing what's being brought to you, but you are interacting with the food and choosing how you're going to behave. And yeah, if you. If you don't understand or haven't been given the understanding or, or choose to to not be aware of your surroundings and you know you wipe your dirty hands on the tablecloth like you've <laughs> that's not a good, that's not a good thing like no one's gonna it, it's it's gonna cause uh, you know perhaps tablecloths to be swapped out or you know dishes are gonna get dirty because of something that you did so you're affecting the people around you but at the same time you're 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 trying to be in the within the context of that family. Um, lear- learning how to interact in that situation mm-hmm. is a, I think, is interesting. And then we, you know, we we grow and and mature even beyond, to serve. you know, uh, table etiquette and and become more aware of who we are as a family. Yeah. And 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 how we or why we're together. You know what it is for. You know, I, I, as a young person, you're not really thinking about those things. You're thinking about. I, I mean, I'm just thinking about myself sitting as a child at a table like that. You know, what are you thinking? Well, what am I going to get for myself? Yeah. <laughs> you know, it, it, how long is it going to take? And I'm going to. Am I going to get some of that? Yeah, Whatever else. It's very self-centric in terms of the that aspect, and and you know, from a more a perspective, a broad perspective of maturity and relationship. The joy isn't in what you take for yourself. The joy is, is in the relationships that you have with the people that are there. The provisions are given. Yeah. You know, there's not even a consideration of who gets what or how much or who sat where or whatever. It's going to be, this is, our, this is our family. This is my people. These are my children. You know, this is, 
you can sense that uh, you know we you know we can probably sense that you guys may have some sense of that too like when you, when the low family gets together for you know the uh, when you guys get together every other year for you know your reunions and stuff your parents are they're taking joy that their progeny is there together mm-hmm. you know that's what's most fulfilling to them yeah. is to get to 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 be to have that com- communion with you in that time and this is the you know in one sense the 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 communion and fellowship that God wants for his people to have with him and together all the time. That's what sets God's people apart. And that's what will always set God's people apart. So, well, let's move into um, some, of the, some of the foundational teaching. And we'll see how far we get today before time runs away from us. So, just a bit of a review. Um, we've looked... Up to this point, uh, more specifically at the, the pattern life of Jesus, and I know it's been quite a while, so it, it may behoove uh, you guys to, to, you know, if you need to review some of the, the previous sessions um, uh, about Jesus' life as the pattern life. What we're looking at more now is discipleship as the business or the work of of. God's house, and, and that that is what God was always intending to do, even through the types and shadows of not only uh, the priestly order, uh, the makeup of the tabernacle and temple, but even in, in the relationships and people that he used to uh, put those things into place. Um, but in review, we saw that Jesus' life was the pattern of that. And he was discipled and trained by his father uh, through the spirit of sonship. Uh, the, and he was the word of God. He, he became the word made flesh. So Christ, the anointed one, was taught through the anointing. And as he matured, then the expressed will of God, the word of God, became flesh. And it was exemplified in the life of the son. And that's that's the pattern by which every son in God's house is to be raised, taught, trained unto maturity in God's house. And very obviously through the apostolic teaching in the New Testament, that is the continued work. You know, what Paul says about even the spiritual gifts given to men, that they are given by God so that that maturity and way of life can be produced in God's midst. So that is for us still today. So we we also see that once Jesus fulfilled God's purpose, not only in establishing or living, manifesting that pattern and way of life, but also giving a, laying down his own life so that sin could be taken care of, and open up a way for us to also enter into that way of life and be trained and raised into it. Then Jesus was ascended to heaven and installed or appointed as king of a spiritual kingdom and a spiritual people and also made to be the high priest of its governing order. So there is a kingdom now and there is a governing order of that kingdom that is meant to be practiced and so he is the, the high priest, the, the instructor, the lead uh, um, in, in um, seeing over, governing over those ruling principles and practices. So in the scriptures, this is known, we're also called the order of Melchizedek, that order of the priest king, Melchizedek, Melchizedek, the righteous king who was king over the city of Salem, the city of peace. So those were all very direct spiritual proclamations of what God's people would be. And that is the king to whom Abraham gave of himself. He tithed to that kingdom, saying, I want that way of life. After having observed many rules, nations, kings, 
it through his travels when God was taking him where he would show him. You know, let me show you, let me show you, let me show you. Well, for Abraham, the quote-unquote let me show you was a lot of trial, hardship, travel, heartache, you know, separation, imprisonment, you know, like what all those things. And But what he learned was the ways of men, the, the governing ways of men, the cultures of men through various nations. And so when he came upon Melchizedek and saw this righteous king who was also the high priest of the city of peace and that there was a governing order at work there and a way of life then he said well that i'm not i have something you know if, if abram at that time is saying well this is what i want i've been here i've seen that i've gone here i've experienced this but this is it and that was right after the king of salem uh, the king of, not Salem, the king of Sodom came to him and said, here, let me make you wealthy. You know, have a part of what we are. And he said, no, I don't want any part of what you are. But I, I, I so I don't want to, I don't want to receive anything from that, but I want to give to this. And when God saw that heart in Abraham and, and the desire, you know, you can, you can almost sense the heart of the, the heart of the father leaping for joy. Like, yes, you know, like, this is what I called you out for so that you could see this and so that it would become your own desire. You know, when he called Abram out of the Chaldees, he didn't say, you know, you're going to be this, and you're going to do these things in this way and whatever else. He wanted Abram to experience that and to observe it and then to take it on for himself. And then immediately when Abram says, this is what I want, I'm going to tie it into this. Then the Lord covenants. So here's this word, this covenant interaction with Abram he says then I will make a covenant not just a city but a nation a whole ruling order I'm going to make you a nation of kings and priests now that was a direct reference to the one to whom he had just tithed the king of, of Salem the priest king well I'll make you a whole nation of priest kings Okay, and so part of what we're going to do is look at how God was doing that continually uh, through history. And so, but that's why we make a refer reference to this order of Melchizedek and even consider it as the current work actively, spiritually, of God in the midst of his people. So the ministry or the teachings of Christ, the anointed one, uh, the anointing is then the work or business of the Father through His Son, and it is to be continued through His church, uh, through discipleship. Let's turn back and review just for a second. Matthew chapter 5. And verse 17. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Okay, so contemporary Christianity has typically interpreted this to mean that the law is done away with. But he is very clear, Jesus himself is very clear about that misinterpretation of his, that being Jesus, fulfillment of the law. I tell you the truth. Until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Well, they will go on to say, well, that was, that was finished in when Jesus died and rose again. It was done. It was accomplished. I don't think so. <clears throat> Jesus would not be so short-sighted even in the knowledge of his commission from the Father to become the sacrifice for sin, you know, to give of his life, to make such a short-sighted statement here in Matthew. Anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. 
But whoever practices and teaches these commands, practices and teaches these commands. That sounds exactly the way that the law was written and, and recommended by Moses. Teach and practice these things. Why? Is it really about following a set of rules? Well, no. It's because they are meant to produce something. And that's the fulfillment that Jesus was bringing. Everything that God intended for the law to produce in man will be embodied in me. It will be fulfilled in this way of life. They point to a way of life. Whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. So what was really missing there? Not the ability of man to fulfill a set of rules in the law. What was missing? The father-son relationship. That is the context in which these things can be fulfilled. They can't be fulfilled by our own efforts to accomplish them. That's where the law was never imperfect. Jesus says, even to this day, not until the passing of all things will the law. The law is perfect, period. Every dot, every, tittle, every, jot, every tittle, every stroke of the pen. But it says, Paul says, where, where it was unable was because of the weakness of man's flesh. So here we go again, the veil of the flesh, the veil over the human heart. Now what is able to tear that veil, veil, veil away? Well, what we see in Jesus' life is that it is when he cast aside his own will, not pursuing it but rather took upon himself the will of his father. So the flesh is done away. The flesh is circumcised. The heart, of, the heart is circumcised. And it is given over to the Lord. And in that relationship, then we see the divine enablement to fulfill the law or become the embodiment of the law. So what were the law and the prophets? They were teachings, instructions, and training that were given by God to produce a harvest of holy people. Why? It will produce in them, through them, a way of life that will set them apart from every other people. In fact, Moses said that very thing. What other nation has a God who has given them this body of laws like we have been given and these things will set us apart from all other nations. This is exactly what Moses said in, in uh, Deuteronomy. Then he says, therefore, be sure that you put them to practice. Why? Because it's not going to be just that I have this body of laws written right here. And I'm like, well, you don't have this. And I have this. No. It's because when we put it to practice and it becomes a way of life, then we're set apart as a people. Then we're set apart as people. Because it produces something. There's fruit in it. So we are set apart for him, the people of God, so that they can be built up in godly wisdom and love as his holy temple, where he can live with, dwell among, and live through them. And that will be the service, the work that goes on in that temple. That others too are raised up, trained up to become a part, to become as one with, to reproduce this culture. So this reproduction, this is the kind of reproduction that God was calling for to Adam, to Noah, later on to uh, uh, the, the, even through the, the disciples, through Jesus. Go and, go and make disciples. That was the reproduction of life. Followers, those followers and practitioners of the way of life. Early on, those things were cut short because of the, not just the ignorance, but the rebellion uh, of man in his heart and selfishness, self-centeredness, and also combining that with the, 
the deception of the enemy to pursue the things of God in a, in a different way, through a different means. So Jesus came to initiate this work of discipleship, of, of how to put into practice this way of life, how to be raised and trained into it, and, and to make a new and living way for it. So then, because Jesus did this, because he did not ever choose his own will, rather always lended himself over to his Father's will, and then when he died and was raised up and ascended to the Father, then the Father entrusted Jesus with the pattern of the heavenly temple. At that point, and even now, no longer a shadow, but to build a real, true, spiritual house so that God's many sons will fill its offices and rooms and carry out its work of service. So this is what Jesus is talking about when he was telling the disciples ahead of his death, I go to prepare a place for you. That's what I'm going to do. Not just I'm going to die and go to hell and release captives, but I'm going to ascend to the highest heights and sit at the right hand of the Father and do this work from there so that I must go so that the Spirit can come and this greater work can be accomplished. So I need to go so that that can be done. Obviously, this is a work that is not going to be done by or with human hands, but through the power or the anointing, as we discussed last week, of the will of the Holy Spirit who helps his anointed or appointed vessels. This is what we call the, the, new, the new covenant ministry um, and service. So this pattern that Jesus initiated, that he started and put to work in the midst of his own disciples, was then passed on with them, through them, to the church, to the called out ones to replicate themselves in this way. To be practitioners of this way. But what we have seen, this is very evident over the last, you know, couple thousand years, over the ages, has been perverted and, and twisted and changed. And even some people with evil intent and wrong hearts have, have continued to twist and pervert what the true work of God is in the midst of his house. You know, focusing on either the wrong things or completely derailed from the path that God has set forth for his people. And completely, that's why so much of, and, and not to you guys so much, but the context of this conversation and teaching, if you take to some Christian circles, it's just like you're an alien talking a different language. I don't even know what you're talking about. You know, and I can I can say that in the, you know over the course of the last decade or so, I know how that feels, having been fully indoctrinated and taught in a certain way about God's plan, God's purpose, and other things. That when when this conversation comes in, it's kind of like, huh? What are you even talking about? Because that's not this. That's not. There's no correlation to the course of life that you're current living that is connected to that. And so, you know, if there are still aspects of this even in our own midst that seem a bit foreign to us, well, there's a reason for that. And it's not, the reason isn't you're wrong and we're right. It's not that. It's that this thing has been so uh, just spread out and run off course and taken different focuses throughout the course of Christian history, you know, the history of Christianity, that it's become this very, I mean, look at look at what's out there. There's a thousand denominations and 10,000 churches and all different belief systems and, you know, people, well, that's not the God I serve and this is my personal Jesus and, you know, I mean, it's just like, there's no, there's nothing the same. And the majority of all of them can say, well, we, we read and study this book. So it's not, it's not really a rejection of Scripture that we're dealing with. It's that the, the, the real purpose and intention of God for and in and through His people has been completely derailed. So let's look at the Scriptures to see that that's, the Scriptures are not missing the mark. Man's 
twisted interpretation and understanding our perspective of the truth that is written is what has really been taken a lot of things off course. But So let's look back in the scriptures and see how this way is, has been the plan and the work of the Father through the ages. So Isaiah 9, 6... Where he says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. The government will be on his shoulders. He will carry uh, the burden of governance. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government, his governing way, his governing order, and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. So again, Jesus was appointed at the right time to reconcile all things, not reconcile all things, not just through his death, and the remission of sin, but also through the manifestation of a way of life. He became what? The light of the world and the light to men. He was showing the way, showing the way of life and bringing back to the Father under an order of righteousness, an order from above. So let's look back and see how this was foreshadowed through... Uh, some relationships put before God's people. One is with Moses, um, and we can see that Moses was similar in that he was sent by God and was the lawgiver to Israel. That's fairly obvious, right? So let's look at how this how this discipleship relationship worked between Moses. And Aaron, from Moses to Aaron and to his sons, the Levites. So Aaron and his sons, when God had them in the wilderness and they were putting together the tabernacle and then the Lord was going to put everything in order, the whole nation of Israel was gathered together and they were all looking at what, okay, here's our leadership and here's what God is doing with us as a people. We've been taken out of Egypt. God has done miraculous things. He's provided for us miraculously. Now, who are we? What are we doing? Where are we going? What are we going to become? Are we just going to die out here in the wilderness? What's the deal here? So God gathers the people together. He brings those who he has appointed up in front of all the people. And it's not just Moses. He's, Moses is bringing Aaron and his sons up in front of everyone to consecrate them by God, and but in front of in full view of the whole nation of Israel and standing before the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of God's presence. So that should be, at least just through the setup, something that says, this means something. This is not just a, a, a pomp and circumstance of, you know, how we're going to parade around in the wilderness and do things. Like the same God that redeemed us miraculously and powerfully from the most powerful entity on earth, the king of Egypt, destroyed his entire army, took all the plunder from him, opened the Red Sea, provided food, water out of the rock. Now this God is showing something about how we should be governed as a people. And he brings Aaron and his sons up. So the tabernacle had been completed. It was prepared for service, but it hadn't been put into service yet. And God uh, consecrated it, approved of it with fire from heaven. So another you know, affirmation. This is God. This isn't the work of Moses and Aaron alone. God is showing that he is here and approving of what's going on. Okay? 
So he fire from comes from heaven, consumes the sacrifice, and there we have this initiation or inauguration of the priesthood. Why? Why did God do it in this way? Why? So that the Israelites would look to them and listen to them and receive from them. These are those who have been appointed by God to play a very specific role in your life. And God is saying, I'm with them. I'm going to show everybody. This is, this is, I approve of what's happening here. <clears throat> So, even so, this was just a shadow of the ministry of the Son of God who would fulfill or embody the law. So, who would become the Spirit and truth incarnate in the flesh. So, through the ministry of the law of Moses, God intended to teach his people how to live together in his ways. Therefore, the dispensation of the law. Read the law sometimes. The majority of it is how to get along with your neighbor, how to relate to other people, how to settle grievances, how to gather together, how to have fellowship and community. What's it going to produce? What's it going to produce? And so he, he said, here are those who are going to help you practice, teach you these ways, and put them into practice. So then, as a nation, you will be set apart or holy out of all other nations because you will know how to live and practice godly life and wisdom. That's why the law was given. And that's why God put Aaron and his sons and said, this is the way that it's going to be done. They are going to help teach you this way. It's, it's, Contemporary theology is still stuck on the fact that Aaron was the one offering the sacrifice and making the separation for sacrifice for sin. It's all about sacrifice for sin and personal salvation and not about a living way of life that's meant to be communally practiced in the midst of God's people. And that God said, I'm going to ordain or anoint or appoint those in your midst who have received my approval to be given to you to help teach you and instruct you and enable you to put these things to practice in everyday life. Can you, I mean, isn't that so much bigger than the daily sacrifice or the Day of Atonement? I mean, I'm not undermining the necessity of those things, especially as it relates to what Jesus Christ accomplished on the cross. That's fundamental. Never to be undermined, never be... But what God wanted to do as an overall work with his people goes beyond that. It can't be done without it, but it's meant to go beyond it. It must become something that is affects the way of life of a people, the culture of a people. So, something we've touched on before, but back in Matthew, in chapter 22, when Jesus... Um, I don't remember the context of the conversation, but it should be easy enough to see once we're there. In Matthew 22, and then uh, when uh, one of the Sadducees and Pharisees, are th they're listening and they want to test Jesus. So they say, one of them, an expert in the law, this is uh, chapter 22, verse 35 now in Matthew. One of them, an expert in the law, <laughs> tested him with this question. Teacher. Which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Now if you look back in Exodus and, and uh, back in Leviticus, this is not even in the Ten Commandments. <laughs> so why did Jesus choose these two and say that they are the greatest commandments? 
you know, in, in the midst of these who study and, and pour over the law and demand it of others all the time. Well, he's pointing back to covenant relationships. The covenant relationship with the Father, with others, and then a divine and godly culture, loving one another. Love your neighbor as yourself. Ultimately, Jesus would say to his disciples, how will the world know who you are? By your love for one another. So in this prophetic act, when God was setting up the priesthood before the nation of Israel, let's look at the characters and the roles that they played as an exemplification or symbolic of what God was doing. So in this place, Moses is like in the position of God, okay? And Aaron and his sons are prophetically positioned as Jesus Christ, Aaron, the high priest, and the sons, the church, to become a nation of kings and priests. To do what? So we have Aaron related to Jesus and then the, the, the called out ones, his sons, the church. You know, this is also referenced in, in Zechariah 3 with Joshua and his associates. Joshua, the high priest, he said, you and your, so, and your associates are symbolic of a people to come. Something that I'm going to flesh out. So what we can see here, and we're going to reiterate this a couple of times, that God has always intended for his sons to rule with him, okay? And they are to work. So what's the work? What's God's business? What's our labor? We're co-laboring with God so that his wisdom and love can be taught, okay, through a way of life. So there is teaching and learning. So this is the, the order of discipleship in the midst. So his priests are to uphold his law or his covenant of love, peace, and justice, and to teach all the peoples of the earth to do so. Now, how can we teach others to do something we don't practice ourselves? We can't. Because we're not just conveying knowledge. It's not just a, you know, let me show you some, some rules and regulations here about things you should and shouldn't do. No. The real, the, 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 the engagement with the priest, it's just been so marred by church history. You know, the priest is someone who, you know, stands between you and God and won't let you get to God unless you do what they tell you to do or unless you confess. And that's why, you know, Protestantism and Catholicism Catholicism has had this huge divide because, well, Jesus did that for us, but again, that's all only related to sin and salvation and not to the, the, co the, the working together, the relational engagement that comes to produce a way of life. Let me share some wisdom of life. Well, the Protestant side of things is just, I'm just going to help you out through life as, a, as this next level kind of thing, give you information, right? kind of help you out and be there for you as this next level thing, but the, you know, there could be relationship there, but mm -hmm. it doesn't mean that there is, just because they're, you know, giving you understanding and stuff like that. And what is it going to mean for a nation to teach all the nations of the, the earth? I mean... It, do, do we imagine that, that uh, when we as a community begin to function in a certain way that we're going to hold, you know, classes at City Hall to teach others how to do it? No. It, that's not the dispensation of, that's not how it's going to disseminate to others. How will it then? Well, first there's going to be a testimony in heaven. First. In the heavenly realm. That there is a living order at work in the midst of this people. That's the first testimony. And then the scriptures prophetically tell us that the, that, that the nations, the peoples of the earth, will see the favor of God on a people and their way of life. And they will come to them and say, what's up with you? 
Why is God's favor on you? Can we go? Can be can we receive God's favor? And then there will be an introduction into a way of life. A way of life. That's why, and that's the nature of what God's people are to become as a nation of kings and priests. Now look at the look at what Israel was at that time. You know, they were they were just a a lost people. They had no no order in their midst. I mean, they were slaves, orphans, cut off from everything. And now they had been uh, freed, liberated from that, but into what? They didn't know. They didn't know who they were, what they were to become. And so God set an order in their midst. Think of this in the context of Christianity. The parallels should be really obvious to us. When Christ, Jesus was set at the right hand of God as the high priest and king of this governing order, the kingdom of God, the family of God, the culture of God's house, and then he gave some to be apostles and prophets so that, well, that's the same thing. Aaron and the priest were appointed. Moses put them in place in front of the people to say, here's how this is going to disseminate. This is how we're, it's going to be made known to you, how we're going to become a certain people. Well, that's the same course that, that Jesus and his apostles and sons are meant. You're not just that because you become it. It's something that's learned. You grow into it. You mature into it. And that's why there's a lot of really, it seemingly, it's not divisive, but exclusive language that's given in the New Testament from Paul's writings in particular where he says, us, you, us, them, us. What's the us? Those who have been appointed and anointed, set apart by God to accomplish this. It's God's appointment. It's not man's appointment. It's not man's vote. It's not man's choosing because somebody's charismatic or capable or gifted or whatever else. It's God saying, this is someone I'm setting apart to fulfill this so that others can be built up into it. That's God's appointment. And part of what we're showing here, this is, guys, this is not a substantiation for mine or Emmanuel's leadership or position or anything like that. That is not the, the way that we think about this or go about it. We also can't escape the fact that God set us apart to do something in other people's lives. We can't escape that. But it's not about trying to self-appoint or select, you know, something so that we can put a hand on somebody, take advantage of other people's lives. We're looking, and neither did this come simply from a revelation of the study of the scriptures. You know, meet, meet with us, you know, personally sometime and ask, how did God set you apart? How, how were you appointed by God to be in such a place? That's an important question. It shouldn't be assumed because it's not assumed on our part. We just didn't, didn't just assume that that's who we are, so we're going to start something. It was something that God did. And if you want to know how that was, well, ask. Let's, let's talk, let that be settled in your heart. And then move on in faith. So, again, this is not a... I, don't, I want you guys to know that, that teaching... These foundations in this not way in this way is not to substantiate our position to try and prove something. It is to, to to look very carefully at how God does things, and then we need to see how God's working in our midst and in our lives. And when we see God's work and we can affirm that it's God's work, well, there's the true <laughs> commitment of that covenant relationship and say, yes, I am covenanting, I am committed to that because I recognize that it's from God, not from man. That's what, that's what uh, Isaiah 9 just said about the government of God, okay? It's what he just said about the government of God and about how it would come to be. He said the government will be placed on his shoulders and he will reign as wonderful counselor, mighty God, 
Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne, the one that God said that he would establish and maintain forever. He will do so with justice and righteousness from that time on forever. But how will it, com how will it be accomplished? Through man's intellect, through man's desire, through man's control? No. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Another prophet said it in this way. It, this will not happen by the strength of man, by the intellect of man, by the might of man, not by strength, not by power, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit. By my spirit, the anointing, the true appointment, setting apart for use of God. This is something for our young people to consider. You know, uh, we're... As we look into your lives, we're looking at where God has set you apart. And to see you come into that calling of life, the fulfillment of the thing that God has set before you, and we're not deciding it for you, we're seeking it out with you. And we're going to come into agreement not with you and not with us together, but with the Spirit of the living God, and then co-labor with Him. Now that's one of the fundamental aspects of discipleship at work in a relationship. I'm not coming to you if, I'm if we're in a, a discipleship relationship and trying to figure out how to make you a better person, I'm coming along to see where God is at work and to co-labor with Him together in your life so that He can produce what He intends to in your life. So, can we also not see that this was the plan of God for, for Adam in the beginning? Isn't it the reason that, that you know this is how God was going to impart that same wisdom of life to Adam before it was cut off? Isn't this the same reason that God called Abram and set him apart with the covenant of circumcision? Cut off the flesh, the ways of the world? Well, yes. It absolutely is. So what? for what purpose did God deliver Israel from slavery in Egypt? Well, not just to end their, uh, end their misery, and their drudgery of work in life, but to awaken them so that they may know him who he who he really is. Worship and fellowship with him in spirit and truth. But he already knew that they were not going to fulfill that, right? I mean like <coughs> like this we we get a picture of this now. Mm -hmm. Looking back on what happened with them. But they are they never fulfilled this. They were focused on, let's have a place, let's have a physical place, and let's have everything set up, and just kind of... Same focuses that we typically take. Yeah. So, you know, in, it, it, like, there's a, there's, a, there's a train of thought that goes off into God's uh, 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 omnip or, uh, uh, omniscience. omniscience that ends up into some very... And I'm not saying you're going there, but that that ends up into some very fruitless conversation, which is, well, if God already knew, then he knew that they wouldn't, and whatever else. Indeed, he did. He said that even at the, even when Moses was giving the law, and Moses himself said, but I know that you're a stiff-necked people, right? But that was actually after that they after they had rejected God at the foot of the mountain. Oh, yeah. He called them up. But they knew that it would cost them their lives. And so they said, oh, we, we, we don't want to die. Let's let Moses do that for us. So then the call even from Christ after his death was lay down your life. Take up your cross daily. So that same requirement of God has never changed. You know, how God... Uh, I, this is going to get in too, too quickly into trouble over whatever else, but like how God would have done that had there been an obedient people who came to him at that time? Well, we don't know because it didn't happen, yeah. right? But God brought them there for that purpose. He called them out as his own son. So when he did that with Christ, he actually directly replicated the same thing. I called you out of Egypt. So in the same pattern. This exact same pattern. So we can see, you know, God's, they didn't get it. They weren't, they weren't aware of what God was trying to accomplish. And, he, and later on, Paul looking back says, we can therefore look back and see 
that this exact thing is what God was wanting to do with them, and they rejected it. So we need to be really careful not to reject what God has done for us because now he has done it in this way through his son, and it's a much greater burden on us to, to not reject it because God did it even in a more fantastic way, you know? So, yes, yeah, so that we may know him in spirit and truth. And, and see, these are the things that Jesus was referring to even in, in his conversation with the woman at the well. You know, the day is coming and now is here. We're not going to worship on this mountain or on that mountain, but God is seeking those who will come to worship him and know him and fellowship with him in spirit and in truth. That's, that's outside the life of the flesh, but not separated from it. You know, that's where the, some of the mysteries that Paul is really excited about when he's communicating through his epistles is, wow, you know, this has been done where I've been crucified with Christ. I'm setting apart in, in bringing death to the certain aspect of my life, the life of the flesh and its desires. But I have, I'm still in this mortal body. But now I'm going to live by faith in the one who gave himself for me, gave me this liberty of life to live in this new way, even though I'm still in the flesh. And so I'm going to count the life that is in me from Christ as that which empowers me, even in the deepest parts of my physical being, to flesh out, to become the express will of God in this life. I can't do it on my own, and I couldn't do it in my place of sin and rebellion, but now by the power of spirit, that it, the spirit of Christ, the anointing that is at work in me, I have been given this power to become something that I could never be. And that's where John says, how amazing is this? That we have been given the right or the power to become the sons of God and live in this way and, and become this full expression of it. So through this, inheritance that God was going to give which was the true nature of God's inheritance is this living dynamic powerful relationship intimate relationship between the father and son the impartation of his heart his ways his desires his wisdom his nature so that we can become mature and therefore also be the first fruits of his spiritual creation that is in the earth but not of it And, there, and then also be his firstborn sons, both physical and spiritual. It's the same gospel. It's the same gospel. They too in this way, the Israelites and others, were to be taught by the Father and trained in his ways so that there would be a spiritual house and kingdom both in heaven and on earth. So let's look at this in the Old Testament, some of the things we were just referring to. Exodus 19. And 3 through 6. Exodus 19, 3. Six. Then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the house of Jacob, and what you are to tell the people of Israel. This is exactly what we were just talking about. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt, and how I carried you on eagles' wings, and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully, and keep my covenant. Then, out of all nations, you will be my treasured possession. God is directly declaring what he will do through that people. If. These are the words, uh, uh, you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy, set-apart nation, not like the other nations of the earth. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. You know, however, we know through the evidence of history and the scriptures 
that their hearts were veiled and they continued to stray away from his purposes. And so God receded. His purpose didn't change, but he didn't force his hand through it. Also, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 4. And in verse 5, he starts and he says, and this is what I was referring to earlier about when Moses is talking to the people about the law. See, I've taught you decrees and laws as the Lord my God commanded me so that you may follow them in the land you are entering to take possession of it, the promised land. Observe them carefully. So what that means is not memorize them and be able to reciprocate them. <coughs> Observe them means put them to practice. Observe them carefully for this will show show who? The nations. One another. This will show your wisdom and understanding to the nations when you put them to practice. Who will hear about all these decrees and say of God's people surely this Great nation is a wise and understanding people. Why? How do they know that? Because of their way of life and what it produces. Now, Moses speaking to the people again. What other nation is so great as to have their gods near them the way the Lord our God is near us whenever we pray to him? And what other nation is so great as to have such righteous decrees and laws as this body of laws that I am setting before you today? Only be careful and watch yourselves closely so you do not forget the things your eyes have seen or let them slip for your heart, from your heart as long as you live. Teach them to your children and to your children's children. Remember the day that you stood before the Lord your God at Horeb. And when he said to me, assemble the people before me and hear my words so that they may learn to revere me as long as they live in the land and may teach them to their children. You came near and stood at the foot of the mountain while it blazed with fire to the very heavens with black clouds and deep darkness. And then the Lord spoke to you out of the fire and you heard the sound of the words, but you saw no form and there was only a voice. And he declared to you his covenant, the Ten Commandments, which he commanded you to follow and wrote them on two stone tablets. And then the Lord directed me at that time to teach you the decrees and laws you are to follow in the land you are crossing the Jordan to possess. And he said that's what's going to make you the people that you are to become when you carefully put it, put it to practice. So when the people of God, when, when the Israelites rejected God, would not come to him, then he put the priestly order and said, okay, then these are those who are going to teach you to practice this way. And it was obviously through that, it wasn't the imperfection of the law, it was the inability of the flesh to be willing to set itself aside and see that produced in them. So, and then we can see through history that later on, even the Levites corrupted themselves. So we have a very similar history in Christianity with the coming of Christ, the setting in of this order of discipleship, and then all of these things happening and men rejecting certain aspects of it, not really wanting to lay down their own lives, their own will to go and to produce the will of the Father, to, to see produced in themselves the desire of God's heart. No, they chased after their own things. So now we see again the corruption of man's heart, even through the grace of God, through his own son. It, it's, it, there's another pattern at work here too, and it's that pattern of, of rejection and rebellion of mankind. Uh, it, it, even after the Levites fell into this, then the judges, you know, there was a period of the judges, which is like a, a high and low period for Israel. And so, and then uh, ultimately, uh, uh, even with the, the, the first, 
the, the, uh, when they went to war and whatever else, and they lost the Ark of the Covenant. So even, even, <coughs> excuse me, eventually even the Ark, which was representative of both God's presence and his government, that was what? Sat on the shoulders of the priests. Think of all the things that we've read prophetically. What will the government, the presence, the governing will of God be set on the shoulders of the anointed one, Jesus Christ? Well, that was representative, represented in the priesthood. So in as we watch the history go, even that was taken, plundered by the enemy. They, they took it to war. They lost. The ark went to the Philistines. And Saul was never able to get it back. And David, when he tried to bring it back, even as a man after God's own heart, tried to do it in an old way and it was, you know, caused a lot of trouble. And then David was pretty exasperated and said, well, I don't know what to do. How in the world am I supposed to handle this? God had to reset things again. So Israel had become, just like Adam and Eve, in a sense, a barren, cursed land. They were incapable of producing any fruit according to the desire of God. What God really wanted to produce in the lives of his people. But God has, still does, he has always preserved the seed. He did with Adam. He has done it through the many generations of God's people, through the, the history of the Israelites. And now, too, within the context of his church and the remnant of God's people in this day. What's God waiting for? Why, where is the patience of the Lord really exercised? He's waiting for people to come to their senses and repent. Turn from the former ways and turn their hearts toward him and his ways and put them into practice. I think that the same historical pattern we if we if we we can probably place it over our own lives and it fits <laughs> where we've turned away from God we've we've tried to do the things of God in a way that was not really his heart and we need to come to a place of repentance and say okay Lord show us the living way let's put it to practice so another example, and then we'll, we'll finish out here today, was, so we just looked at how that was uh, disseminated from Moses to Aaron and his sons, representative of God appointing Christ and the church. And now let's look at this same pattern in the life of Samuel, David, and Solomon. So in, from, the time of the, uh, from the time of the judges. So... Samuel was raised up, but the ark was not recovered. The people began demanding a king. They wanted to be like the other nations around them. But Saul, once he was placed as king, well, he never embraced the true heart or purpose of God. God's ways. He, he, he practiced the, the liturgy you know, I remember when Samuel rebuked him and said, well, sacrifice isn't what God's going for. He wants obedience, something that is with his heart. So you don't know the ways of God. So the, the kingdom was torn away from Saul. And Saul was tormented and still unrepentant. Now David was anointed to be king. He was set apart or appointed to be king as a very young boy. The least of his brothers. So that God's intent and heart could be shown. So their hearts could be turned and people restored. This is where, you know, even when Samuel was anointing David... And David's father and his brothers were looking upon him as the least among others. And God had to, in a sense, rebuke Samuel a little bit. You know, and he said, Samuel, I, I don't look on the outside. I look on the heart. I see the heart. Man looks on the outside. But God looks on the heart. So David subdued the nations 
around Israel. He set up the priesthood according to the law of Moses. So a reinstitution of the order, that, the governing order that God had set in place with you know, Moses and Aaron and others. He had the ark carried in and set you know, rightfully this time according to the law and the way that the Lord had ordained it to be. And then God revealed the pattern of the temple to David. So something was set in order. Now he was given the pattern of the temple, but he wasn't allowed to build it. That is really a fascinating thing to me. Because Jesus came, fulfilled the heart of the Father, subdued the enemy, shed his own blood, but was taken to the right hand of God before the church was built. Very similar, right? That's not something that is showing a lack in Christ because remember David was told by God through the prophet Nathan, you're not going to be the one to build the house because you've shed too much blood. But your son will build the house. So there's a part of this that is similar in the sense that Jesus Christ was set apart as a man who was very much after God's own heart, who fully subdued the enemy. He, he conquered death in the grave. And then he ascended to heaven. But it was given to his sons to build the house. And he will do so as the ruling king. He will rule as the ruling king and his sons will be given the labor of the work. So David passed this knowledge to his son Solomon and instructed him. So there's teaching, instruction, guiding to build a temple for the Lord. David didn't see the completion or the dedication of the temple in his lifetime. Interesting, right? Jesus has ascended to the right of the hand of the Father and it says that he will stay there until his enemies are made to be a footstool for his feet. And the commission that he gave to his disciples was to do this work to build this spiritual house. And they took that on and said, that's our work. That's what we've been appointed or set apart to do. So after Solomon was anointed king, so again, we see the anointing taking place here. It, there, it was symbolic with oil, but it was, it's spiritually, there's a shadow, a type and a shadow, that, it, that there, you must have the anointing to be that which brings forth the truth and reality in this, in this work. So he finished the temple. He dedicated it on the Feast of Tabernacles. That's when the temple was de dedicated. During the, uh, and then God's glory came and filled the temple. So that is a prophetic look at the completion of God's work in our midst. And not just a small community, but in the midst of the remnant of God's people now. So that his glory can be seen. And that glory is not going to be that lights shine out all over the place and people see it. It's going to be an expression of the wisdom and way of life that we live. That is going to be the visible expression of God's glory. It's going to come through our way of life. And it will fill his people. So... Again, we have a prophetic act here. Samuel in the position of God, okay, symbolically, prophetically. Saul, representative of the Adamic race that forfeited the heart and plan of God, went their own way. And then David, representative of the first coming of Jesus and the work of building the temple, the tabernacle, laying the foundation teaching that to his disciples, to the, those who would become the apostles, and then go and take this truth, this way of life, and begin to disseminate it into the communities of people. Here's how we practice it. Here's how we put this to work. So the earthly temple of their day was not the house in which God wants his people, obviously, to worship. No. Just like what Jesus said to the woman of the well. The true wor worshipers... Those who truly honor what God is looking for in a people will worship Him in spirit and in truth. A living way. A, a, a living expression of life. And all that you do expressed and fleshed out in the relationships that you would have and everything that is involved in those relationships and the decisions of life. That will set you apart. A, a, an expressed wisdom of life. So through the discipleship of Jesus, which is the work of the Lord, that's the, the business of God, 
the business of the Father's house. God will build a spiritual temple for himself. Jesus laid the foundations, and his apostles or disciples, the apostles means, apostle means, sent once. Sent by who, though? The votes of men? The agreement of men? The charisma of man? No. Set apart by the Spirit of God. Set apart and appointed by God himself. The same way that we're looking at how a divine relationship needs to be looked at. Not because we share things in common. Not because we like each other or, you know, whatever that is common to the ways of man. But something that is unique to the ways of God. That's anointing. It's an appointment. It's a covenant. It's a commission. It's a setting apart. It's holy. So through his sent ones, then they would build on the foundation of Christ, on that cornerstone, while they were being built into it. The mystery and the power of God's work in, a, in our midst. So we can see through these two prophetic spiritual pictures, that's the majority of Israelite history there. Well, this is the overwhelming work of God in their midst. And it was completely looked over, and it's, it's still being completely looked over by Christianity as a whole. We see these two prophetic and spiritual pictures. They speak of the same design and pattern within both the domestic personal relationship and the national representation or lives of the people under the law of Moses. That's what they were to represent to each other and to all the nations of the earth. Jesus fulfilled the earthly ordinance and in the spirit, and they were also fulfilled or embodied by his disciples. They became an extension of his way of life. Christ followers make disciples, and they were to become a new people, a new Israel, the true Jew, <laughs> the real expression of what God wanted his people to be. Again, we can see this is, this is what's been basically, you know, watered down through the ages. And then ultimately, watered down to the extent that it has become, it's lost. The true gospel's lost. What God's really going for has been lost in the midst of mankind. In the majority. But God has preserved it. So again, you know, this is not something that we are saying we have uniquely because we figured something out or we're starting something new or whatever else. No, I mean, the, the, the prophets, <laughs> Old and New Testament have said, pay more careful attention to what you've been taught. Look again. Seek out the ancient ways. What was God doing from the beginning? Consider it. Weigh it out heavily. What did he? What was really being dispensed or brought through the angels, the law, and what was really being brought into reality through His Son Jesus Christ? Is that really what we're about? Is that really what we're setting ourselves apart unto God for, so that He accomplished, so that He can accomplish it in us and through us, or? Are we so overwhelmed with the wilderness of life and the nations around us and what everybody else does and how everybody else does it that we are willing to step off that path out of the way of what God wants to do in the midst of his people? You know, will we be, will we, will we join in with, with the, the voice of the scoffers that says, well, you know, everything's pretty much like it was from the beginning. Nothing really changes. Well, the scriptures tell us, well, that, that's going to be the nature of man. Jesus said, well, the, the last days are going to be like the days of Noah. Everybody's going to go around eating and drinking and marrying and, and living and dying and burying and, you know, everything goes on the same. Until God says, well, I'm moving on. And I, for my part, I know for your, I know you guys are there too. We want to be partnered with God 
in the fulfillment of his work. And if that's really our commitment, if that's a covenant that we have committed to, then that needs to that needs to go backwards into every relationship and decision and outlook in our life. What are we really for? Who are we really for? And is God able? Is God's word true? Is his promise effective to us? Well, I believe so. And I can see it working in our hearts, in the hearts of our young people. But it's not an autopilot deal. It's not just going to happen because we have some mental agreement with it. Moses' recommendation along this line about this word of truth was if you carefully observe James said if you look at the law and behold its perfection but you don't do anything about it then your faith is useless it doesn't produce anything so be not only hearers of the word but doers put it to practice Make it work in the way that you relate to others, in the way that you make decisions, in the way that you resolve conflict, in the way that you eat your food, in the way that you work your job. There's no area of life left outside this covenant. And that's not the restricting scrutiny of God. That's man's view of it. It is a glorious freedom to co-labor with God to His ends and for His purposes. And let's be a thought that. Next time, we'll look a little bit into how this was, the, this is also, these patterns and this work, this business of God's house, the work and labor in God's house was exactly what the apostles taught. And we'll see that in Peter, Stephen, James, Paul, others, but we'll look at that next time. Brother Ben, you mind praying for us? Lord, we are indeed humbled and grateful for the the truth and the and the word, Lord, that you desire to be made manifest, Lord, in our in the way we live out our lives. Lord, in the, in the way that you desire for your people to, to live and interact with you and with one another. Lord, continue to reveal yourself to us. And Lord, indeed, may our hearts and souls, Lord, our minds be transformed, our, our hearts be drawn toward you, and our wills be submitted to your way. Lord, may we indeed volunteer and participate and partner with you Lord, you are a mighty and holy and trustworthy God. And Lord, we are a small-minded people often. Lord, we confess that our, our ways and our understandings, when left to our own devices, are far, far away from, from your great and perfect desire. So Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to look back and see the work of your hand. Lord, to see your purposes and in more illumination as we as we go Lord we we cry out to you in a knowing that we can only do this Lord with your help and within the unity of your body Lord as you have purpose it to be so Lord give grace to each one or to those leaders and call out appointed ones who have been given a, 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 a task that is outside of this world, Lord, beyond this, this living plane. And Lord, may each one who you have called to your body and to your house um, be eager to respond to your call. Lord, we bless each house, each family, Lord, each father and mother, daughter and son, Lord, we, we bless each one who has been called to you and each one that um, is part of this, 
this small community and your greater body. Lord, speak to those who are suffering. Speak to those who are struggling. Lord, encourage them, not, not in a human way, but in a, in a true and real way. Lord, we, we, we would even ask for, for a mighty move of your spirit. Lord, we would ask for um, your ways to be made known, and even in, in mighty and spiritual ways. We all also would ask, Lord, that your gentle and true and good practice in our everyday lives would be um, ever progressing forward. Lord, thank you for lighting that path, not leaving us alone to stumble in the darkness, but for giving us, giving us a way. Lord, thank you for this time. Thank you for this season. Once again, we look forward to the goodness that you have in store for your people. Lord, thank you for your patience and long-suffering with us. May we be found pleasing in your sight in all that we do. We'll bless your name in it. Amen. Anyone else have an, a prayer to offer or a, a vision to share? Please go ahead. Ben or Noah, either one of you guys see anything? Uh, no, not today. Justin, Nicole, or Elaine, John? Um, I didn't really see anything besides a small um, idea sort of the Lord was just sharing with me, hmm. confirming um, that what you're talking about is a process that showing me pictures of showing how things go through a process to become what they are intended to be. And mm. um, he was just reminding me that our ways are not his ways. And um, so just being encouraged that I want to be in his ways, that his ways are different. They're not going to look like our ways are going to be his ways and what his ways look like. And so, I think it was just confirming and reminding to stay alert and stay awake and stay watchful and um, of what those ways are. That was it. You pray for us, sister? Yes. Father, I'm, I'm so encouraged by... your love of a people that it just withstands the test of time that you can have such a love and affection for a people that you just don't ever stop standing by us and moving us towards you it's almost consuming and overwhelming because it's so magnificent to stand next to something so profound can be a bit very full, very filling, but very in awe, very large, but so full of desire. To be in this way, in all things, in every way. Lord, we need your strength so much to do this. In your, in your mercy, in your grace, Lord. We want to, we want to just come humbly, so that we might <laughs> hear your call to be taught all of these things. Your willingness to teach us is so amazing and so beautiful, Lord. Let us be taught. 
Is it possible, Lord, that we would hold nothing back from you? That in our everyday, day-to-day life, we would see the work that you are doing because that is where it is done. It is done every day. It is every day that our minds and our will and our emotions are turned to you so that you can make us the spirit, Lord. Teach us that turning. Bend those things, Lord, to your way and to your presence, Lord, so that we might see and move and function in that reality, not this one. That is the desire, Lord. Build in us the ability to see, Lord, every day in the daily things of life. That it's nowhere else but in this, in these moments where you are removing our enemy. You are taking back the ground that he thinks he has won, that he has tried to win. You are removing the snake that has slithered and wound itself so tightly around all these ways that belong to you, Lord, that have, he has tried to just blind us. I can just see him. I can see him spiritually woven around the home of a believer in all these areas. And it's just our job to unwind him and release him back to hell and open up the space for truth open up the space to you alone father so that you can do a good work because it is your work it is you it is you it is you alone it is not us but we are so happy and so thrilled to be called yours so that we might follow in your way Please, Father, let it be so. In Jesus' name, amen.